Hello everyone, you are watching the third part in the 11th video of Genesis in a Bible study video series. In this video, we will go through Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Before we go any further, I just want to stress how important it is not to think of the account of Babel as separated from Genesis chapter 10. There's a good reason why I included these verses into the 11th video. Chapter 10 is commonly called the Table of Nations. The Table of Nations greatly helps us understand where all of the nations came from. However, if you view it as separate from the account of what happened at Babel, you're likely going to miss something very important. I'll explain myself at the end of this video. Verse 1 begins, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Come, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build us a city, and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The KJV footnotes say that verse 1 could be translated this way, And the whole earth was of one lip and of one word. In other words, the whole world spoke the same language and used the same words. It's interesting how both lip and word are used in this verse, because language and words are two different things. In verse 2, the ASV footnotes suggest in the east. Since the ark landed on the mountains of Ararat, and, according to a map in Haley's Bible Handbook, Ararat was north and west of Babel, it makes sense that it would say they journeyed east, or in the east. On the other hand, the King James Version says, quote, from the east. I think the ASV is probably more accurate here. The ASV footnotes say the word translated as slime in verse 3 could also be translated as bitumen, which is exactly what Strong says the word means. This isn't the same word used in Genesis chapter 6 verse 14 when God told Noah to pitch it, quote, within and without with pitch, but it can be used for the same thing. While I have no idea where he gets some of his information from, maybe some of it's from ancient Jewish tradition, Josephus does seem to make some good points. Speaking of Nimrod, he says that he led the people to build the tower. Was Nimrod the one who encouraged the people to do this? If so, he may have taken control of the people and replaced Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth in the eyes of almost all of his relatives. On the other hand, the information in scripture doesn't directly state this. It says that Nimrod was mighty, and that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and other cities in the plain of Shinar. Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. Whether he ruled Babel before or only after the dispersion is not stated. I suggest we keep both possibilities in mind, unless there's more conclusive evidence. Another thing Josephus said was that the tower's purpose was to safeguard the people from another flood. He mentioned three characteristics, its height, its sturdiness, and its waterproofing. This is an interesting thought, since these characteristics, a great height, sturdiness, and bitumen to make it waterproof, would be what the people would want if they intended to withstand another possible worldwide flood. Did the people of the earth go to the extremes of thinking that together they could fight or withstand God? Strong says the word translated as city in verse 4 means a city, a place guarded by waking or a watch, in the widest sense, even of a mere encampment or post. Babel was probably a place with a military watch. 
maybe even a wall. The purpose of this protection might have been to show man's military might, and possibly to defend themselves from the Almighty. Notice that what they say in verse 4 is in contradiction to what God commanded in Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. Remember that the word translated as replenish means to fill. Instead of filling the earth, they stayed gathered in one place. Strong says this about the word translated in verse 4 as name, a primitive word, perhaps through the idea of definite and conspicuous position. An appellation, as a mark or memorial of individuality, by implication, honor, authority, character. Strong says the word translated as scattered means to dash in pieces, literally or figuratively, especially to disperse. It seems like the people viewed being separated as a bad thing and that being together was empowering. In the next verses, Jehovah actually seems to agree that their collectivism empowered them. They seem to have wanted to make a memorial to show that they were unique and that they could rally around. Verse 5 continues, And Jehovah came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And Jehovah said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is what they begin to do. And now nothing will be withholden from them, which they purpose to do. Come, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So Jehovah scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore was the name of it called Babel, because Jehovah did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did Jehovah scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Some people might not like that verse 5 says that God, quote, came down to see, and that verse 7 says, quote, let us go down, and there. This probably makes them think of Greek gods, Roman gods, Egyptian gods, and so on. They may ask the question, why does God need to come down? Is this a sign that in early times the Hebrews had a more primitive view of Jehovah, and, like it said of other ancient religions, their view evolved over time? In general, the answer is pretty simple. No. Throughout scripture, Jehovah is said to be powerful, yet he is also shown to have certain characteristics similar to humans. God is said to be a spirit, John chapter 4, verses 19-24, through 24. yet he can and has interacted with physical humans, Exodus chapter 16, John chapter 1, verses 1-18, through 18. Acts chapter 9, verses 1-9, through 9, and so on. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Obviously, the ability to create things out of nothing is the greatest example of power. In Psalms chapter 147 verse 5 it says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. So, of course God is powerful. On the other hand, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, it says that God made man in his image. Verse 27 says, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, it says, quote, in the third month after the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. And when they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the wilderness of Sinai, they encamped in the wilderness, and there Israel encamped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and Jehovah called unto him out of the mount, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, 
and tell the children of Israel. And in verse 11 it says, quote, And be ready against the third day. For the third day Jehovah will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Notice that it says that Moses, quote, went up unto God, and that Jehovah would, quote, come down. In Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 38, right after it mentions that Moses set up the tabernacle, it says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of meeting, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of Jehovah filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward, throughout all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Jehovah was upon the tabernacle by day, and there was fire therein by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel, throughout all their journeys. Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 through 22 says, And Jehovah said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now, and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned from thence, and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before Jehovah. Jehovah says here he will see if the cry was true, and he is also standing near Abraham as a man. If this surprises you, read the whole chapter to verify this for yourself. It's apparent that God is both infinitely powerful and yet has certain human-like characteristics, because we were made in his image, not because he was made in ours. This is why many talented artists have tried to depict God as a powerful, human-like being because we were made in his image, and yet have failed in showing God as he is. So with all of that said, would I say that Jehovah couldn't know what the people were building unless he came down to see it? No. Why did he come down then? Well, obviously because he wanted to. What else can I say? In Judges chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, it says, And the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Israel. And he said, Because this nation have transgressed my covenant which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations that Joshua left when he died, that by them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of Jehovah to walk therein, as their fathers did keep it, or not. So Jehovah left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. These verses say that Jehovah would prove the children of Israel. Would I say that Jehovah didn't know what the children of Israel would do? No. In fact, in Exodus chapter 23, verses 31 through 33, it says, And I will set thy border from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. God knew what would happen, yet he still decided to prove the Israelites. Why? The simplest answer is this, because he wanted to. Bottom line, God is powerful, and God seems human-like because humans were made in his image. Other than that, we can try to understand, but he's God, and his ways are ultimately beyond us. We can't scientifically test God, so the only way we can understand who he is and what he does is through past experience, either our own or someone else's, and through him revealing himself to us. The main way he has done this is through scripture. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 through 13, speaking to the Israelites concerning the prophecies that were already spoken to the prophet Isaiah, as well as God's mercy for his people Israel, though also relevant for us in some ways, says, Seek ye Jehovah while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto Jehovah, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, and giveth seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to Jehovah for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Strong says this about the word translated in verse 6 as people. A people, as a congregated unit, specifically a tribe, as those of Israel, hence, collectively, troops or attendants, figuratively, a flock. It's interesting. The same word the people used in verse 4 is the same word used here in verse 8. It seems that the people try to resist, but you can't fight against God. Governments try, individuals try, but in the end, Uthunatonistim, it isn't possible. We're still here because of his mercy, not because of our own strength. I've already said this in the second part of this video, but I'll say it again here. Strong says that the word Babel means, quote, confusion. Babel, i.e. Babylon, including Babylonia and the Babylonian Empire. Now that we're done, let's go back to discussing what you would probably miss if you didn't think the account of Babel is connected to what Genesis chapter 10 covers. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, implied that the whole earth dwelt in the plain of Shinar. Verse 6 further implies that the people that are being referred to in this account were all of the descendants of Noah, as well as Noah and his wife. Notice the use of the word one in these verses. This was not the children of Shem, or the children of Ham, or the children of Japheth only. Everyone moved into the plain of Shinar. Now, notice what it says in the beginning of verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Back in chapter 10, verse 1 it says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, namely, of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. As I've said previously, these words seem to begin new sections within the book of Genesis. This would mean that the table of nations and the account of the founding of Babel are meant to be taken together. With all of that in mind, ask yourself the following questions. Why was Nimrod said to be the ruler of Babel in chapter 10 if Ethiopia was named after his father Cush? Shouldn't Nimrod have lived in Ethiopia with his father? Did he travel from Ethiopia into Babel to oust the ruler of Babel? Why did Abraham live near Babel? Was Babel the land of Ham's children or the land of Shem's children? The answer to these questions is simple. All of the people lived in the plain of Shinar originally, and it wasn't until God confounded their language that they separated and went into different parts of the world. In other words, Genesis chapter 10 is an overview of the dispersion. Chapter 11 verses 1 through 9 is a continuation of the chronological account of events. The people who couldn't communicate after God confused their speech most likely separated from each other. But many of those who could understand each other probably stayed together. So, Nimrod and Cush may not have spoken the same language after what happened even though they were father and son. Nimrod stayed in the plain of Shinar, 
and Cush left. Abraham's forefathers stayed, and others left. More than likely, the people that stayed in the plain of Shinar included descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, since all the people originally lived in the plain of Shinar together, and began to build Babel. Just because Mizraim was the founder of Egypt, and Mizraim was the son of Ham, doesn't mean that none of Shem or Japheth's male descendants and their families went with Mizraim when he left Babel. This just means that he ruled over them, and his closer relatives were probably in the majority in Egypt. This is equally possible with all of the other nations that originally came from the plain of Shinar. The sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth might have intermingled a little as long as they could understand each other. Also, don't think that the sons of Ham only married the daughters of Ham while they lived in Babel, or the sons of Shem only the daughters of Shem, or the sons of Japheth only the daughters of Japheth. They all lived in the plain of Shinar. They probably intermarried, the wife probably taking on the family name of the husband, and so being associated with the family and later nation of her husband. Either God made most smaller family units, father, mother, and young children, to understand each other, or there was a lot of upheaval in families because of the confusion of the people's language. Some might point to Genesis chapter 10, verses 5, 20, or 32, and say that because it mentions languages, it's not true that everyone lived in Babel. However, I've already shown you that Genesis chapter 11 verses 1, 2, and 6 imply that everyone who was alive at that time traveled to and lived in the plain of Shinar. Although there may have been a very small number of people who weren't involved in the building of the city and tower of Babel, like Noah, who was righteous according to Genesis chapter 6 verse 9. So, why does chapter 10 mention languages? The answer is that chapter 10 is a genealogical and national overview. It mentions people that were born and mentions that they ended up speaking different languages and living in different lands. My guess is that many of the people mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 were probably born sometime before or soon after the people traveled to and lived in the plain of Shinar. Chapter 10 is an overview of what happened after the dispersion and the account of what happened at Babel gives the cause of the dispersion. If you thought that the Table of Nations was separate from the account of the Tower of Babel, you would likely think that the people spread out on the earth at the same time that, or before, Babel was being built. You would be a little off track, probably thinking that only Nimrod's people had their speech confounded, since Nimrod was the ruler of Babel, and wondering why Abraham came from the plain of Shinar since he's a descendant of Shem. There's a good reason why this account is included with the table of nations between the phrases found in Genesis chapter 10 verse 1 and chapter 11 verse 10. You can watch these Bible study videos directly on YouTube, or you can conveniently watch them embedded at donaglass.com. If you would like to purchase videos in this Bible study video series, go to www.dinagolas.com store for information on products and prices, and a link to the Dinagolas store.